Questions on deadlock or the labs to get us started? Or the final project now that the description is out? Alrighty. Uh, so we ended last time uh, talking about ways to avoid our philosophers starving. Uh, as they were all holding on to uh, the chopsticks. Um, and those, we could kind of add another chopstick or impose some order on how these resources are acquired to prevent deadlock. Uh, and the kind of last point that I wanted to talk about deadlock is. What if we could predict the future? What if we could somehow we could avoid granting any request that would lead to deadlock. That is, say, some thread asked for some memory, and we had some way of knowing that if we granted this request, deadlock would be possible in the future. We could just not grant that request uh, in order to avoid the possibility of, of deadlock occurring. So, there's like, we would need to know something about the programs that are running in order to make this prediction. And in particular, if If we have all threads declare, okay, this is the maximum amount of resources that I will need. This is the maximum amount of memory I will need. This is the, the uh, whatever resources we're managing. If we have each program tell us this is the most that I will ever need, then we can start to make predictions about, okay, assuming that we make this allocation, is it possible for some currently running thread to eventually get the maximum amount that it needs? And so assuming that we have this information, we can implement a technique called the banker's algorithm. Uh, to kind of do exactly this, avoid granting requests that could lead to deadlock. Now, this algorithm gets its name from the analogy of you have a bank, it's lending money to businesses, it has a fixed amount of money to lend, uh, and each business that it's lending to has some sort of credit line that it can, a maximum amount it can borrow. And a bank wants to make sure that it never has lent out so much money that if a business showed up and said, I want my full credit, the bank would just not be able to ever meet it. And none of the projects that it's lent money to would ever be completed, and thus it would never get paid back. So that's where this name comes from. Personally, I'm not deeply familiar with banking and loans, so this analogy is, I don't find it helpful. Maybe you do, but that's where the name comes anyway. Um, and there's kind of more detailed pseudocode in the notes 
from the deadlock topic for this algorithm that I'm going to go through now. But I just want to sketch out uh, the basic idea uh, is that we're going to keep track of kind of the each each thread's kind of maximum need for the resources that we're managing. Uh, the current available resources and the current allocations that we have made to our threads. So in particular, we can know how much more would each thread possibly need compared to what we have currently given it? And how much do we have currently left to give out? And we are going to have kind of two methods or two functions that using this information we can say A system is safe if we can say uh, there is a thread whose current who who we have enough resources available that we could meet that thread's maximum need. So if safe says there exists some thread that needs X resources and we have at least X resources available. And so, and at that thread, we give it all the resources it needs, it's eventually going to finish and release its resources and then some other thread can finish. So it's safe if we can uh, find, um, uh, that, that we can find a thread uh, who we can help to finish and would be safe says, If we do some particular allocation, would that result in a safe kind of state of this system? If we gave out some allocation to a thread, kind of would it be? Uh, would there still be a thread that could finish? So, this is kind of a pretty abstract definition. Uh, so, I want to kind of connect this with a, a concrete example. Do we have eight pages of memory? And memory is the resource that we're going to be thinking about for this example. Uh, process A, in order to complete, is going to need four pages of memory. B will need five pages of memory. And C will need five pages of memory. So, is this a situation where you can just give everyone their maximum memory and we'd be fine? No, because we have 14 need across the pages of memory needed across these three processes, but we only have eight uh, uh, in our uh, available. And so, If we were to hand them out one at a time, kind of as, as each process asks for more memory, we kind of just give one to each process as we go through. And we think of uh, kind of we can track how much does A, B, C have at the moment, and how much total that we handed out. They all start with. Zero, 
and then we'll give one to A, and then we'll give one to C, and then we'll give one, uh, sorry, to B, and then we'll give one to C, and we'll just keep going through kind of handing these out. Uh, a gets the second one, B gets the second one, C gets the second one. So, anyone have a prediction for where we're headed in this situation? Yeah, we're, we're headed for, for a, a terrible deadlock pileup disaster where we give a final one, a, a third one to A, a third one to B. We've used all eight. And now our processes are all just you know, waiting and waiting and waiting uh, to get the additional memory they need. So just kind of blindly handing things out without taking in kind of these considerations uh, that we have in the banker's algorithm, uh, we end up in a deadlock. And the key idea in our banker's algorithm is our system is allowed to kind of just delay before actually meeting a request. And we particularly want to avoid the situation we got into here where we kind of kept handing out memory to processes that weren't ever going to be able to get enough memory to finish, thus denying any process what they need. So if we go through this again using our banker's algorithm, which says only hand out memory if it would be safe to do so, if we would have enough left for some thread to make progress, otherwise delay. So, start out in a similar way, which I was clever enough to erase, where we're going to kind of hand out the first seven pages of memory. to the second one for C, and then we give a third one to A. Why is it acceptable, why is it safe to give a third one to A? Because uh, A only needs one more and we still have one more left to give. Yes, exactly. That after we hand out this third one to A, we have one free page, A only needs an additional free page. Can we give a page to B or C? No, those are unsafe requests. They would deny A its last page, and that one page is not enough for B or C to finish. So uh, B has to wait, C has to wait, and we'll give a page to A. A can now finish, and so at some point later, uh, A releases all the pages holding, other processes are still waiting. And so now our total allocated is back to four. And we can start handing these out again. A is done, not going to use any. We can hand a third uh, to uh, B. B is still a two. We can hand, uh, at this point, what are, what would be safe allocations? Could we safely allocate to B, or to C, or both, for an, for an additional page? Yeah, why, why could we give it to, to either one? Okay. After allocating to either of them, you still have two pages left, which is enough to finish B. Exactly. We just need to make sure that whatever the, the one of these can make progress, so yeah, it's okay to give a third page to C. But now, 
we can't, uh, whichever one that we give an additional page to next, that also needs to get the page after that. So it can get all the way to five. So B, we give it up to its fifth, it frees it, and then C can finish. And so we have used this strategy of we know, as long as we know the maximum amount of, of memory. And so you can think of the operating system might, uh, or, or whatever system this is, when a thread starts, part of that protocol might be, all right, declare your maximum memory needs. And you're never going to get any more than that, so tell us how much you need. Um, yeah. And given that information, we can then meet requests in such a way that the system won't, won't deadlock. Oh. Wait, I'm curious why this algorithm, because I feel like this algorithm is still deadlocked. Like, if A wants one page, and B and C both want seven, and you get four to B and three to C, like, one of them can still make progress, A, and then once A finishes, it's deadlocked still. Um, so, if A only needs one. Yeah, and then B and C both need seven pages, and you get four to B and three to C, because uh, A can make progress, right? So, yes, I believe this case is covered. Um, since Wait, they only need one one second. Well, no, you get four to B, like three to C, and you, they, they want seven each. And then you can still make progress on A, so don't think that violates. Like, it's still safe. Um, but then once A makes progress, there's no safe. Yeah, I, I have to think more about that. I do think that this will handle that case, um, but let me get back to you on that. Um, yeah, I may have not, I may have expressed it safe a little too simply um, to, to cover that case, but yeah, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Is there any like, assumptions before you build the algorithm? Like, any assumptions before you build the Each process can like, ask more than the algorithm. Um, yes, we are, uh, I guess we are guaranteeing that the, that our allocation strategy will not cause a deadlock. And if a process asks for more, said, I need more pages than were available, giving pages to that process is, like, would never be safe because it's just going to, like, take up those, those pages and, and never give them back. Um, so, yeah, so, so processes, like, on, on, in this sort of system, there'd be an incentive for a process to, like, be honest about its memory needs and not overstate them because this algorithm will, in some sense, penalize those that uh, would have, like, a high potential for, for deadlocking the system. Other questions? Sure. How does a program know how much memory it's going to use before? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so one way would be whoever implemented this process implemented it, uh, uh, profiled it to see how much memory it used in practice under various inputs, and kind of empirically determined, okay, how much memory am I going to use? And kind of uses that figure to say, uh, to tell the system this is how much memory uh, you would also kind of, rather than empirically, uh, depending on the complexity of, of the code, kind of just analyze it uh, statically and say, okay, I'm doing these allocations, so, and these kind of all add up to this amount of memory. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you think it's possible for machine learning algorithms to figure out, like, they do their own like, testing process and then can actually implement the Vincus algorithm? Uh, so you're saying, could we just give a machine learning algorithm a bunch of examples of here is an allocation of the deadlock, here is not, and it learns some policy? Yes, I expect that you could do that. Okay. Um, uh, you might uh, use a, a reinforcement learning technique, something that an algorithm is getting like, uh, 
is taking actions and then is at some point is told this you get a positive reward or a negative reward. Like there's deadlock or there's not. And it kind of learns which actions are bad uh, through a lot of a lot of trial and error. So I think that, that would work. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know of a situation where that would be, be better than kind of coming up with kind of a, a handcrafted algorithm, but yeah, that would be that would be an interesting experiment. All right, so through all this kind of deadlock stuff, uh, through all the concurrency stuff, we have kind of approached it as we are at the mercy of uh, the scheduler. Like there's this part of the operating system kernel that is making decisions about ru what runs when. And we have constantly been fighting against, like, well, what if the scheduler does X? How do we avoid catastrophe? Like, we have to kind of assume all kind of possible inconvenient scheduling. And so we're finally to the point in the course where we're going to actually look into what are the policies, what does, how would the scheduler be making these decisions of what runs when. Like. So to kind of define some terms up front. We have the workload of the scheduler, which is a set of tasks to perform. And this is kind of deliberately general because these sort of scheduling decisions, they apply to kind of a kernel deciding what threads to run, but also to a web server deciding which requests to fulfill in what order. Uh, and uh, other kind of situations. Uh, and so these set of tasks, they can be um, uh, any size, meaning they can be very long, they can be very short, uh, they can have any amount of time. We're going to assume that we have a preemptive scheduler. which just means the scheduler can intervene and switch which task is running. We're not required, we're not waiting for a task to politely yield its time on the CPU to some other task. Our scheduler has the ability to just go in and change who's getting to run. Well, Assume a work conserving uh, uh, scheduler, uh, which means if we have tasks to do, we're going to be working on something. We're never going to leave the CPU idle if there's work we could be doing. Um, if we have a non preemptive scheduler, so like this work conserving seems pretty intuitive. Like we don't want to, to just be leaving the CPU idle. If we had a non-preemptive scheduler, meaning our scheduler could not switch tasks, the tasks themselves would be kind of yielding the processor to someone else. Uh, could we run into problems following this work conserving? This is a really, really big task. We could just go with that one. Never perform that. Exactly. That we risk starting like we have a, a short period, like a short period of idleness. We risk starting some really long tasks, and then we can't interrupt, and everything else ends up delayed. So this work conserving, like clearly appropriate when we have preemption. But if we don't, it may not actually be best. So no. no. Uh, so,
We should also think about what performance metrics are we going to use, like what things might we care about in terms of evaluating different scheduling algorithms, like different ways of deciding what runs when. So I'd like you to take about five minutes and discuss, with, brainstorm with your neighbors, what are possible metrics, like what are things we might care about in terms of the system's behavior or the scheduler's decisions that we, that we would use to say this is a good scheduling algorithm or not. All right, let's talk about metrics. Who has a, a metric for me? If you have some set of tasks, uh, everyone might be how many of those tasks do we actually complete? Uh, yep, throughput, maybe measured in tasks per second. So how quickly are we are we getting through our tasks? That's a good metric. Talk a lot about like fairness and how you measure it versus like even like fairness with a weight even, and also fairness over like certain time periods. Like you might want it to be fair over like an aggregate period of like a minute, but also we want it to be fair over a second, so you don't have processes that sit idle for a really long time and get behind. Yeah, fairness we definitely care about, and this gets to a good point that defining fairness uh, is probably complex and probably varies from system to system. But we, we care something about like, we're not just like leaving a process to starve forever. Like we need to be eventually giving everyone a chance to run. So. We had a third one that kind of ties into both of them, and so you can put into either, I guess. But uh, the rate at which it switches between tasks, because um, really high rate just means you spend most of your time kind of making decisions, um, and also it ties into fairness stuff. So. Okay. Yeah, I think that playing into this and maybe other metrics is the overhead of our scheduling algorithm. So if we have a lot of overhead that's going to affect the throughput, might affect fairness, might affect other things. So yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, this might be tied to fairness, but maybe getting a higher priority task done. Yeah, so we have both fairness, but maybe we also care about unfairness. Meaning that if we have, We probably want our scheduling algorithm to have some way to actually prioritize things that need to happen, um, and not be just like dogmatically like it must be fair, like no one gets priority. Um, the uh, socialist utopia of scheduling. Uh, no, so some unfairness probably helpful in practice. Other metrics. Two. I'm not sure system be applicable to this algorithm? Yeah, so we're uh, potentially scheduled, like if we're thinking about a, uh, a web server, uh, Google's web server fielding millions of, of requests, like whatever algorithm it's using to decide how to, to uh, schedule these needs to be able to handle uh, very large sizes. Um, but I think that kind of throughput probably captures like as input grows, does throughput like stay consistent or uh, or keep up. Any other thoughts? Well, I wonder if it's like random like randomness, like how random is it the scheduling? Or is it like a you always go in this order? Could you could for the different things you might want one or the other. Yeah, we might care about the predictability of the scheduler. Uh, for example, we run some program, it takes a second. We run it again, it takes 10 seconds. Uh, if this is the scheduler's fault, I'm gonna be mad at the scheduler. It's like that variance is just not, it's like it's fine if it varies a little bit, but kind of beyond some point, now I just can't rely on the performance of, of threads on this system. I'll add one other in here. that we're very often going to care about and that we'll, we'll focus on, uh, and that is the response time, not rate, response time. And this is the average time it takes to complete a task. So we might care about how many tasks we're getting through per second, uh, but also if we start a task, on average, like how 
quickly does it finish? Uh, and this gets to elements of fairness, like if we're delaying a task forever, its response time is going to be very long, and thus this kind of average response time will capture, like, are we actually kind of completing each task uh, in time that's sort of roughly proportional to how long it should it should take if it was the only thing running. Okay. But, but if the scheduler is always like working, right? it's never idle, then the response time, if you average them out, like, they will be the same. Oh, so, so, so you, like, do you need to like, take another approach, like, like square or something? Uh, yes, so... I think uh, actually they will not always ever have to be the same, and we'll we'll see an example uh, of of how that works. Um, so let's consider a couple possible scheduling algorithms. Uh, our good friend first in first out tasks just form a line, and we run them in the order they arrived. Uh, Seems completely fair. Like you just get in the line. We've all we've all done that. Um, is there some? Is there some workload, some set of tasks that we might imagine FIFO would be especially bad at? Uh, the first one runs forever. Yeah. If, our, if the first thing that comes in, super long. Uh, we're going to run that first, um, uh, and so we might see something like if we have tasks one, two, three, four. Uh, FIFO might say, uh, "All right, first task that comes in is this really long one. So down here is time." And then two, three, and four come in. They're all short. And so FIFO uh, just runs the tasks in the order they came in. Uh, yeah, so. But don't we have the clock which will automatically interrupt and like say go to the next one? So the scheduling algorithm, the clock is part of the scheduling algorithm. The clock gives the scheduling algorithm a chance, if it wants to, to change okay. what's running. Under FIFO, we say we're just going to run task one until it's finished, okay. or it yields the processor. Then we'll run task two, and, and so on. So uh, this situation, response time is not great. Because kind of, let's say we're imagining one, two, and three, four kind of basically all come in at about the same time, just like slightly. Uh, these are slightly later, and so the response time for like two, three, and four is like a long lag between when we the task kind of arrives at the scheduler and when it actually completes. And so kind of the average response time for all of these is sort of as long as task one takes, even though these three are quite short. Does that make sense? All right, so let's, uh, anyone have a suggestion for how we could rearrange these tasks to get the best average response time? Right, we could run the shortest tasks first. Exactly, we could do, Shortest job first, or it's sometimes also called um, uh, shortest remaining time first. So I'll call it SJF. So shortest job first uh, it says exactly that. We're going to, instead of running them this way, task one, two, three, and four arrive at almost the same time. We run the shortest ones first, 
and we achieve kind of optimal average response time. Because we're always kind of running the, the shortest things first, so our tasks kind of the uh, the time between when the task arrives and when we finish it is kind of as short as we could possibly make. So can we just like implement shortest job first in all our operating system kernels? Seems seems like a great algorithm. Uh, I see people shaking their head. Why not? Carl? Uh, if more short jobs keep getting added, then the longer ones will never have a chance to run. Uh, yeah, so we do have this issue of um, kind of sad fairness. Um, like, should shortest has to always get to go first? Uh, also, starvation, where if short jobs keep arriving, we always delay this long one. Also, like, we just don't know how long a task will take. Exactly. We don't have any way of knowing when a task arrives how long it will take to run. So the shortest job first actually relies on knowledge that we don't have. So, even if we might be willing to put up with its downsides, we can't actually implement it. Not exactly anyway. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, any other downsides to our shortest job first? If shortest jobs keep arriving all the time, we're going to end up switching between tasks quite a bit. Uh, and so we might end up with a lot of overhead because we're always going to be switch switching to the shortest job. So that could be a problem. Um, and it's, it's bad for predictability because our, our longer tasks might take way longer if shorter tasks keep arriving. So good for response time, but not necessarily. Uh, ideal. So one kind of other uh, algorithm we should talk about is round robin, which just says. Uh, Run each task for a fixed amount of time. We'll often call it a time slice or a time quantum, but some like fixed unit of time. And uh, if we have um, uh, if we go to our example here, we can think about What if we had a one millisecond slice? Then maybe we run kind of one millisecond of task one, then two, three, four, those all finish in under a millisecond, and then we're back to task one. We could, uh, if, if I change this from something short, like much, uh, like the, the size of a small task to something it's maybe uh, half the size of, of task one. Uh, any predictions of kind of how this picture will change as I increase my time slice? So you'd have the first half of the task one before you went to two, three, four. Exactly. With a longer, a longer slice, I run 100 milliseconds of task one. Then each other task gets a turn. They all finish, and then I go back to task one. So, how does how does round robin do on our, our metrics over here? Right. Excuse me. Right. I thought I thought you. It's pretty bad on predictability because like if you have like ten processes running versus twenty, it'll take twice as long. So it's like really based on what your computer is doing. Like if I run code, it's just insanely variable on how long it takes. Yeah, and and that's that's a, a decent point that it is.
it's going to be quite bad for tasks of equal length. Uh, so what I mean by this is if we consider, if we go back to our, say, one millisecond time slice, and now one, two, three, and four are all the same kind of length of task. We keep slicing between them over and over and over, and kind of they all finish kind of much later than uh, either FIFO or shortest job first would have alternatively. Uh, given us, we run all of task one, then all of task two, then all of task three, and all of task four. And kind of under FIFO, a shortage job first, our response time gets much better because we're actually finishing tasks rather than doing a little bit of each of them uh, and finishing kind of as late as possible. Uh, so round robin, not, not great for predictability, has an equal length. Uh, any any strengths to, to round robin? In fairness. Yeah, in some sense it's quite fair. Kind of every task is getting the same the kind of same amount of time on the on the processor and we're kind of just switching between them in a, uh, in, a in a predictable way. So we've outlined these kind of different possibilities. And I want to finish by sketching out an algorithm that, in practice, most uh, of our uh, modern operating systems use some form of this. called a multi-level feedback queue. Uh, and the chapter from the OSTEP book, uh, the assigned reading for today, um, has a really nice explanation of this algorithm and kind of walks through uh, a series of examples that kind of motivate its design. Uh, so I'll talk about some of that here today. Uh, but first, talking about Theodore Roosevelt. So you may remember, became president when uh, William McKinley was assassinated. Um, uh, and Roosevelt was uh, a kind of ferociously capable guy. He uh, read uh, an incredible amount. He wrote history books. He um, uh, was a, a, a colonel uh, in the Spanish-American War. Uh, in fact, he was uh, he was quite a pro-war guy. Uh, when war broke out, he resigned. Um, I think he might have been uh, like undersecretary of the U.S. Navy. He resigned. He recruited a kind of regiment of volunteers that called themselves the Rough Riders, and they like went off to Cuba to fight the war. Um, and kind of journalists wrote kind of glowing uh, portrayals of uh, of these Rough Riders, and it's kind of increased Roosevelt's. Uh, national uh, fame. Uh, in addition to, to being pretty pro-war, he was uh, definitely pro-imperialism. So for example, Roosevelt wanted to build a canal across the uh, isthmus in, in Panama that was currently part of Colombia. Uh, and so under Roosevelt, the US was like, hey, Panama, would you like to not be part of Colombia and be your own country? Uh, and he was basically kind of convinced Panama to break off so that then we could uh, lean on Panama to build a canal. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, you may have, have heard the, uh, the famous line from Roosevelt, speak softly, carry a big stick. Um, what, uh, was into like uh, parading the U.S. Navy around the world to intimidate people. Um, uh, he was also a kind of master of the media. Uh, he in some ways originated the idea of a press conference. It's like, I'll make a place where journalists can hang out 
uh, at the White House, and I'll go and talk to them regularly, and then they will report on what I want to say. Um, uh, and uh, this was um, uh, a time when uh, U.S. Uh, politics was still uh, very uh, sectionally divided, um, and Roosevelt uh, runs for election on uh, in his own right uh, and and wins, uh, and then he decides not to um, uh, not to run for kind of a third slash his own second term, despite being very popular. Uh, he then immediately regretted this, uh, and in fact would cause. Uh, political chaos when he tried to make a comeback uh, in 1912. During that campaign is, to me, the, one of the most remarkable Roosevelt stories. He's giving, he, he's there to give a campaign speech. Uh, someone shoots him, and with the bullet inside him, he gives a speech that begins like, I have a bullet in me. He speaks for an hour, uh, and then and then gets medical attention and survives. But that's just the kind of the kind of crazy he was. All right. So, multi-level um, uh, feedback cues. Uh, the idea here is that we have a set of round robin cues. So we have, we're, we're using round robin, but in particular, we separate these round robin cues into some multiple levels of priority. So it could be just two, it could be 10. That's a kind of implementation detail. And importantly, each level of priority uses a larger time slice. The top level maybe is 10 millisecond slices, 20, then 30, and then 40. And so each of these cues when a new task comes into the system, it goes into the queue at the top uh, at the highest priority. And then it eventually gets its 10 milliseconds to run. Uh, and if it doesn't finish in those 10 milliseconds, it gets bumped down to the next level of priority. And if it gets another 20 milliseconds, if it doesn't finish, it gets bumped down to the next level of priority, and so on. And so, this actually, in some ways, approximates our shortest jobs first. The kind of new tasks come in at this high priority, they will be run very soon. And if they're short, then they'll finish. If they're not short, they'll keep bumping down into lower and lower priorities. Uh, and so kind of long running tasks end up at the bottom, and we just kind of run them when there aren't any shorter tasks kind of yet, yet to run. And our long running tests kind of get rotated through in a, in a round robin way. But What's the order that it runs the first task, like at the, the top of the queue for each of these different uh, priorities? Like, does it run everything one first, or does it do runs one thing from one, runs one thing from two, runs one thing from two? Ah, so um, uh, it, will, it will go through running everything at the first priority, and it only runs something from priority two if there's nothing in the priority one queue. Oh, wow. Hey, um, are those time slices arbitrary or set, or is it dependent on how, like, the basis of how long the task is going to be? Um, so each queue would typically have a set time slice associated with it. Um, so I, I think I think you could make an app, uh, an implementation that might try and uh, like intelligently like adapt these in some way, but uh, not normally. How do you prevent starvation if you always are running everything in the 10 millisecond one? Uh, yes. So um, that is an issue. 
uh, and the solution that's proposed in the reading um, is every, after every, like you pick some time period and kind of sort of like our, our, our clock interrupts, but it's probably longer. Um, at the end of that period, everything in the lowest queue is moved back into the top. So in this way, like you have a task that's going to take uh, 10 seconds. It kind of runs in little bits all the way down to the lowest. And if there's lots going on, every so often it's like brought back up and gets to run its way kind of back down to the queues. So in that way, you do prevent the starvation of, of long running tasks. Uh, they kind of get treated as uh, on kind of smaller new tasks that's arriving every so often. Um, one other detail here is that if a process uh, uses the CPU and uses less than 10 milliseconds, it says maybe it starts a disk I.O. and kind of yields the processor. If it yields before it runs out of time slice, it gets put back in the same view. So if you have a process that's doing a lot of I.O. and not using much CPU, it will have high priority for its like CPU parts. Uh, and so this also has nice, nice performance for uh, I.O. bank processes. Other questions on our RNMFQ? All right, so my clock says uh, 206. Uh, oh, yeah, that also says 206. But I think we can end there for today. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Um, I will. Uh, have a, a lab five FAQ uh, out on on Monday on NLC then. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody blew it through a hole.